Hey guys, Ashley D. Will here, and today we are looking at ending the war with myself. We're going to look at chapter three today. This is the book, Ending the War with Myself. It's by my ministry partner, Mickey Land, and she has retired. And so I'm going to try to go ahead and teach this on uh, my YouTube channel so that I can make it available to people who can't make the classes or who miss the classes or who can't take the men who can't take the classes so that they can learn about this as well. Okay, so we've got chapter one was called Something is Wrong. Why don't I connect with God's love? In that chapter, we learned about all the ways how we block our connection with God by condemning ourselves, etc., etc. And then chapter two is called God Esteem. And so that chapter showed us that we're trying to get our esteem from the wrong person, from ourselves, from other people, and that's not going to work. The only place we can get esteem is God, and we get God Esteem from Him because we are His children. Okay, so chapter three is called Another Gospel That Is Not the Gospel. Okay, this is another gospel. This is not the true gospel. This is another gospel, okay? And after this chapter, you're going to be able to pinpoint when you're hearing a gospel that is not the true gospel, okay? So let's try to review this. In approximately 30 minutes, like I said for the other, uh, in the other two chapters, these are normally an hour and a half, these classes are, but I'm trying to go over these in around 30 minutes. So we have Ending the War with Myself, Chapter 3, another, in quotation marks, gospel, small g, lowercase g, because it's not the real gospel. It's very common, very common. When you hear this chapter, you will have a sense when you're hearing another gospel. Okay, so knowing the real gospel, the real gospel is very important because it enables you to spot the false gospels that are out there. Okay, you know how in the banks, how they train the tellers? They give them the real $20 bill, $50 bill, $100 bill, and they have to memorize the front and the back. They have to memorize it. See, they don't have to go out and, you know, know what all the false bills and all the counterfeit bills look like because all they have to know is what the real one looks like. And that's what this chapter is going to show you what the real gospel is so that when something is not the real gospel, you'll be able to say, ah, no, that's not the real deal. So first of all, we have to look at what the word gospel means. What does it mean? Well, this will give you a good indication of whether you're hearing the true gospel or not. Because gospel means good news. Good news. So, if you are hearing something that is not good news, that is an indication that you are not hearing the true gospel. You are hearing another gospel. All right? That's just one basic point that you can always remember. If you're getting a heavy burden, that's not the good news. If you're feeling weighed down, there are all these things you have to do, it's not the true gospel. So if the gospel is good news, then that means that what? It means that the law is not good news. So if the true gospel is good news, that means that the law is not good news. Why not? Well, let's look at why the law is not good news. 2 Corinthians 3.6 tells us that the law kills. That's what the law does. The law kills relationships. The law kills your spirit. The law kills you. It kills as all it can do is kill, kill, kill. It never gave life and it never can and it never will. So the law is in fact the ministry of condemnation. 
It is the ministry of condemnation. It crushes you every time you try to fulfill it. See, the law is the written revelation of the righteousness of God Almighty, the Ten Commandments and all the other laws. And so when we try to fulfill that, we are subconsciously saying, I'm God and I'm going to prove it. See, and that's why you get crushed every time you try to fulfill it, because God will not be mocked. And if he will not be mocked, then guess who will be mocked? We will be mocked, right? So the four purposes of the law are important to know why God gave the law. Why did he give it in the first place? Well, the first purpose of the law is to define sin. Romans 7, 7 tells us that we wouldn't know what sin was if the law had not defined it for us. See, we're born in this smoke and mirrors, sin, brokenness, perverted view of everything, and everything is wrong here. So we wouldn't know what it was if it bit us on the nose. The law has to define sin for us to tell us what it is, because otherwise we wouldn't know. Number two, the second point of the law, the purpose of the law, is to point out sin. It arouses sin and it points out sin. Romans 7, 8 tells us that. The third purpose of the law is to condemn us. The third purpose of the law is to condemn us and Romans 7, 10 tells us that. So the law defines sin. It says this is sin, these things, and these are not. It makes it very clear. The law also arouses and points out sin in us. So if you want to have sin aroused in you and stimulated and provoked and for to grow sin in yourself, you go to the law. That will make sin as big and strong and powerful as it can be when you put yourself under the law. So it defines it, it arouses it, points it out, it condemns it, and it condemns the sin in us. So the law condemns us. And then fourthly, all of this activity here is, in, in these three first three purposes are going to, the, the, uh, hopefully, it will drive us to Jesus Christ. It will drive us to a Savior because it shows us that we need a Savior. It shows us that we are helpless sinners in the hands of of a just God and a righteous God. And that is supposed to drive us to Calvary. I need a savior, help, what do I do? There he is, let me run and go and find him and cling to him. So this is the fourth purpose of the law, to drive us to Christ. Romans 7, 24 and 25, uh, make that very clear. It says, wretched man or woman that I am we see that we are hopeless and that we cannot save ourselves. And then it says, who will set me free from this body of death that I live in? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. So wretched man that I am, who will save me. It doesn't say what will save me. It says who will save me. And that is the point to drive us to the who it's talking about, and that is Jesus Christ. So in this knowledge that we have now, that gospel means good news, and that the law is not good news. Why? Because it kills. And these are the four purposes of the law, to define sin, to arouse and point it out, to condemn us and drive us to the cross, we have three choices now that we can live by. Three choices. So let's look at these briefly. So the three choices that we can live by with this knowledge, number one, we can live by the law. We can just stay right here and live by the law. We can talk about sin. We can define sin. We can have the law uh, 
living under the law, we can let it arouse sin in us. We can point it out in ourselves. We can point it out in other people. We can let the law condemn us. We can condemn other people. We can condemn ourselves. And then we can finally let it drive us to Christ. But if we stay over here under the law, these things we will never leave behind. Okay, so here are our three choices down here. Live by the law, that's number one. Number two is you're saved by grace, but you live by the law. Okay, this, this is called Galatianism. I did a video on the dangers of Galatianism. You might want to watch if that, if you're interested in that or that sounds familiar to you, you need to watch that video because uh, the scripture says you foolish Galatians, you silly Galatians. So the scripture says you're a fool if you live in this place, number two. Okay, this nullifies the grace of God and you have severed yourself from Christ. Galatians 5.3 tells us you've been severed from Christ. You who seek to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. So that's number two. Watch out for number two. Most churches live in number two. Okay, number three is a little bit different. This is saved by grace and live by grace. Very few people in the entire world live here. Saved by grace and live by grace. So that's just a little tip. So falling from grace, we learn from the scriptures in Galatians 5.3, is not about sinning. It has nothing to do with sinning. It's about putting yourself back under the law of Moses, under the law of condemnation. Remember, the law is not good news. You're putting yourself under the law of condemnation after you've come to Christ. See, you go to Christ and then you go backwards. You're going backwards. And you're putting yourself under the law of condemnation. So when you think there is something that you can do, anything, any little thing, that you can do apart from Christ to please God or perform for Him or impress Him, you are deceived. That is your pride trying to perform the law, to be good enough for God. So your pride, in case you don't know, wants the glory. And it will never, ever, ever give the glory to the Lord. It will fight tooth and nail until you die to get the glory and steal glory from the Lord Jesus Christ. Until you surrender that, it will still have a hold on you. So, ergo, Jesus plus anything is another gospel. That's how we know it's another gospel. First of all, it's not good news. And secondly, it's Jesus plus something, right? Jesus Christ needs nothing ever added to his finished work. Why? Because his finished work is perfect and complete and eternal. Believing in that alone makes you perfect and complete in his eyes. In his eyes, regardless of what your feelings, circumstances, or behavior are doing. Believing that that his finished work for you is perfect and complete and eternal makes you perfect and eternal in his eyes. That is the gospel. And Hebrews 10, 14 tells us, by one sacrifice, he has perfected forever those who were being made holy. That's you and that's me. So the only standard acceptable to enter heaven is perfection. Are you perfect? Are you? Am I perfect? If not, then we need a Savior. If not, we don't need to go performing and finding what will save us. We need to go to the who to save us. He's the only one who will. And going to the who, Jesus Christ, is not a list of rules to follow. And we need to be aware of and remember that our imperfection is exactly what God needs to display his perfection. Our imperfection is exactly what he needs to display his perfection. Okay, so this 
here, number three, in contrast to up here, the law being the ministry of condemnation. Number three down here, this is the ministry of acceptance. Let's write that down. The ministry of acceptance. Have you ever been accepted by anyone? People tell us they love us when we're growing up. Yes, I love you. Yes, we will. And you know your parents love you and all that. But have they really, ex do you feel like they really accepted you? Have you ever been fully accepted by anybody? Well, if you haven't or you need more acceptance or that is a need in your life, this is where you find it right here. Number three, the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that he is and everything that he has has been given to us in his grace. And so you will find complete and utter, full, 100% acceptance, 24-7, 365, if you find yourself on death row one day. Does that change? Nope. Still the same. Right here, that's what you get. It never, ever, ever changes. The sooner you realize that, the easier your life's going to be and the more you're going to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. So number three is the only choice that would be the true gospel. Okay, so let's look at some of the Jesus Plus uh, teachings that are out there. Things you will hear in and out of the church and they're kind of undercurrents and they're spirits. They're, they're these undercurrents in churches that feed this mentality. It's the flesh trying to get in on things. It's, it's the calloused hands of uh, pharisaical people who want to add to the finished work of Jesus Christ. And this has been going on. It went on when Jesus was here, and he lamb-blasted the Pharisees. He condemned them to hell with the eight woes. Go read Matthew chapter 23, and you'll see how he feels about this other gospel, all these other gospels. Well, let's look at some. Jesus plus what is another gospel. This is not the capital G gospel. This is the lowercase g gospel. So what could we put in here that would turn the gospel into another gospel? Anything you add to the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. Anything. Now, get, get a load of this. Jesus plus circumcision right? Weren't the, the early church believers saying, well, we need to be circumcised, don't we? No, you don't. So circumcision, you do not need. Jesus plus baptism. You better get baptized or you're not really saved. Have you heard that? Jesus plus nothing. What about total immersion? Well, I was baptized, but they didn't quite dunk me under the water all the way. So did it really count? Have you heard that? What about the denomination that you're in? Or what if, have you heard people say, well, if you're not Catholic, you can't be saved. Or if you don't worship on Saturday, you can't be saved. Or if you don't do this, then you're not the real deal, right? That is denominational, denominationalism. What about, I mentioned Saturday worship. What about the idea of being on duty as a servant of the Lord 24-7, 365? Have you heard that? Talk about a heavy burden. What about daily Bible reading and prayer? If you don't read your Bible every day and pray, you're missing it. You're missing the mark. Have you heard that? You're really not spiritual if you don't do that, right? What about if you wear pants or makeup or jewelry or you do these certain activities, then you're really not saved. Do you see how all of these are adding to the finished work of Jesus Christ? Um, what about no drinking alcohol, no smoking cigarettes, no, uh, same thing, different types of activities that would disqualify you? This is a huge one. What about traditions of man? This is a real big in the church. Anything 
that's added to the finished work of Jesus Christ that looks churchy, that looks spiritual, is something we have to do over and over again, right? The scripture tells us that anything that has to be repeated is not perfect. So think about that when you hear and see traditions of man. You have to go to church every service. You have to go to church every service or you're not spiritual or you're not saved. Say, you, have you heard that? What about confessing your sins? This is not um, the confessing your sins unto salvation, which 1 John 1, 8 and 9 talk about, but this is confessing your sins in a ritualistic way. Uh, any type of ritualistic way that requires you to confess your sins or you won't be forgiven for them. See, in that you're trying to maintain your own salvation. Jesus hasn't taken away your sin. He's only taken away some of your sin, but you have to take away the rest of the sin. See, one time the Lord said to me, you're going to confess your sins to me, the ones that I've already taken away? Okay, go ahead. He was kind of encouraging me to grow in that. And then, of course, I'm sure you've heard tithing. Um, if you don't tithe, you're not spiritual. If you don't tithe, you're not a Christian. If you don't tithe, God won't bless you. All of these things are Jesus plus something else. And all of these make the gospel another gospel. All of these are Galatianism. Okay? You can watch the Dangers of Galatianism video I did a while ago, and it goes into more of this. I think I did three categories in that video. I tried to make it real simple that way. But so that those are some Galatianism tendencies and some Jesus plus something else to add to him. Do you understand that when you add anything to the finished work of Jesus Christ, you have nullified the finished work of Christ? You have nullified it? You have defiled it? See, that is evil when you are defiling the finished, perfect, eternal work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The bottom line, it's flesh, it's evil, it's devil, it's the world system. It is not the Holy Spirit. So just FYI, remember that. So Jesus plus is another gospel. And this Jesus plus here is the law mindset. It's the law mindset activated in your head. So you, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. You're not following the Holy Spirit. You're following the law. You're under the law and you're living by the law, but claiming you're saved by grace. This is, you're divided on the inside. One of you, part of you is allegiant to the law and part of you claims to be saved by grace. But see, the scripture says you can't do both. If you do that, you've fallen from grace because it's grace alone plus nothing. So, oh, over here, I need to mention James 2.10. This is what I call the checkmate verse, and it makes things real clear about the law. Listen to this. For whoever keeps the whole law, all the Ten Commandments and the 633 other rules that they had to keep, if you keep the whole thing, your whole life, but one time you stumble on just one point. Guess what? You are guilty of breaking all the commandments. If you stumble one time in one point of the law, you're guilty of breaking all of them. So do you see the black and white issue that God makes this? It's either you're God or you're not. That's what he's saying. Only I can fulfill all the Ten Commandments and live it perfectly, and I'm God. And you can't, and you're not God. He's making that very clear. So this is a checkmate verse to say, you want to try to live the law? Keep yourself clean before me and take away your own sin. And you want to try to fulfill all of these uh, commandments and be good enough for me? You're going down. Beware, you're going down. So that's pretty serious, a pretty serious verse. Um, 
we went over Romans 7, 24, 25. Who will save me from this body of death? Not what can I do to save? No, it's not about us. It's about who. And it's the who is not us. The who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Who will save me from this body of death? The Lord will. Of course, that's the whole point. We went over Hebrews 10, 14. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Romans 6, 14. For sin, listen to this. For sin shall no longer be your master. It will not have mastery over you. What? How can that be? Because, listen to this. You are not under the law, but under grace. So what is this verse telling us? That when we are in number three over here, not in Galatianism, not under the law, we come all the way down here, we jump off the cliff and say, Lord, I can't do this. You have to save me. You have to live your life through me. I can't be good enough. Belly up. You're God and I'm not. What happens? Sin is no longer our master. The Lord sets us free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because we have forsaken the law of sin and death for him. We have given that up for him. We're trusting him. We're not trusting in ourselves to try to save ourselves. We're saying, I can't do it. I'm clinging to you and I'm trusting in you. That's when he really shows up. Okay, Colossians 2, 11 and 14. These are very powerful verses. Uh, Colossians 2.11 says, In him, the Lord Jesus Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. This is nothing that you can ever do to circumcise yourself. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off, removed when you were circumcised by Christ. I even have... A poster down here that I did a video on is called Circumcised by and Brought to Fullness in Christ. And this is a picture of that verse. Jesus Christ circumcised our flesh off of us and put his DNA in us, raised us from the dead. And so this is who we are now. This is not who we are anymore. It's not. The scripture is very clear and it says that. We are not the unregenerate nature anymore. And then verse 14 says, having canceled, canceled, that means he's blotted it out. He's taken it off the table. It doesn't apply anymore, and it's not there anymore. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, the charges that were against us according to the law. All the laws of God we've broken for our whole lives, past, present, and future. That legal indebtedness, which past tense stood against us and condemned us and accused us and is what the enemy uses to continue to accuse us and condemn us, he has taken it away. He has taken it away by circumcising it off of us and... When he took it off of us, what did he do with it? He nailed it to the cross. He nailed it to the cross. All right? That is conclusive. So Romans 8, 1 and 2 is, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who were in Christ Jesus, because, how can there not be any condemnation? Because through Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life sets us free from the law of sin and death. Sets us free from the law of sin and death. So the sooner you let go of the law, the sooner the Holy Spirit will take over and set you free from that because you're not clinging to it anymore. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, all of this good news, all of the good, not the another gospel, bad news, law, bad news, but all of this good news, the true gospel is from God who has already reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He doesn't count our sins against us. And we want to agree with him. 
and not condemn ourselves and count sins against ourself. And then John 19, 30 says, when he had received the drink, this is Jesus as he was before he died, Jesus said, it is finished. See, he knew what he had just done. He knew that the work for the sin payment for all men, for all time, for all sin was perfect and complete. And that's how and why he said it is finished. My work that I came to do to take away the sin of the world is done, period. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. His work was done. See, and only an almighty God who is perfectly good and, and loving can do that, can take away sin. We cannot do that. It's not even possible. All right, another thing is that John 1.14 tells us that Jesus Christ, when he was here, was full of grace and truth. Full of grace and full of truth. And so when we follow him, we want to be full of grace and full of truth. So Amos 3.3 3 says, how can two people walk together if they're not in agreement? It's a rhetorical question. They can't. So this verse is telling us and many others in the scripture that we want to walk in agreement with the Lord in what he has done. And the farther along that we agree with him and the deeper we go in, in agreeing with him and the deeper we believe in what he has done, the more we will experience more of what he has for us. He has a lot for us to experience. It is our unbelief that keeps us trapped in this dimension. It keeps us doing the same cycles over and over again over here. It keeps us spinning our wheels in the mud, wasting our lives, not storing up treasure, but storing up wood, hay, and stubble. So there is a handout I gave out to the class, and it's called Jesus Took Away Your Sin, and it lists all those scriptures. I will try to post that down in the information box if it will fit, or maybe I'll do a link for it. But um, so Jesus Christ has taken away your sin. Did you know that? He's taken away your sin forever. All the sin in the past, all the sin in the present that you're that you're struggling with, maybe, and all the sin in the future that you may commit. So He has taken care of that. It is a done deal. There's nothing left to discuss. He's the final word. I'm not making this up. It's not my um, idea or final say. He said it. I'm just pointing to him, what he said. He's the creator of the universe. He created us. He makes the laws of the universe. He's the top guy. He's the, he's the head judge of the entire universe. He said this. I'm not making it up, but I do believe him. See, the scripture tells us that we believe and then we will see. But the world system says, let me see, and then I'll believe. See, when you start to believe, you will start to see what he has done. You believe he's taken your sin away, he will start to reveal that to you because you're walking in agreement with him. And remember, number three is the ministry of acceptance, and that's over here. Live by the law, no Saved by grace, live by the law. No, that's Galatianism. Number three, yes, saved by grace, live by grace. This is the ministry of acceptance offered exclusively in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nowhere else you can get this in the universe ever, anywhere. But only in the Lord Jesus can you get this acceptance, this love, this um, just overwhelming agape love and compassion. It's incredible. Okay, our time is about up. Let's say a prayer, and we will close. Okay, the prayer is, Lord, please help me to see that living under the law and condemning myself brings a self-curse to me, and it is not your will. Please help me to live in your grace and truth and learn to accept myself just as you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so that is chapter three of Ending the War with Myself, and it is about another gospel that is not the gospel. So I hope that something I've said has been helpful for you. 
And I hope that you will join us for the next um, seven chapters, chapters uh, four through ten. And we will go deeper into this issue of ending the war with myself. Again, each one of these chapters is a peg in this fortress that keeps the division inside of you. And so when you knock out each peg, the division inside you crumbles and you can come together on the inside in a wholeness, in a more whole state in and of yourself and in Christ. You're more united with him because you're not all divided inside and you're more united with him because you're actually believing what he says and you're not trying to figure all this out in the smoke and mirrors of the deception of human reasoning. Okay, so you guys have a fantastic week, a blessed week, and I'll see you next time.